lunar Sabbath vindicated by the 70 weeks prophecy. The 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel 9 is one of the most remarkable prophecies in all of Scripture, as it unassailably identifies the precise years of the Savior's baptism and crucifixion. Sadly, many either grossly misinterpret this great prophecy or overlook its larger implications. A close examination of Daniel's 70 weeks irrefutably disproves a Friday crucifixion and the notion the modern seven-day week has cycled without interruption continuously since creation. In the ninth chapter of Daniel, the angel Gabriel reveals to Daniel the timing of Messiah's advent and the future of the Jewish nation. Gabriel begins by telling Daniel, Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Here, heaven makes clear that 70 prophetic weeks had been allotted for Daniel's people, the Jews. In scripture, one prophetic day equals one literal year. I have laid on you a day for each year. From this, we conclude that 70 prophetic weeks, 490 prophetic days, is equal to 490 literal years. In verse 25, Gabriel states clearly the starting point and the ending point for the first 69 prophetic weeks of the count. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. Here we learn from the command to restore Jerusalem until the coming of the Messiah would be 69 prophetic weeks, seven weeks plus 62 weeks. This is the equivalent of 483 literal years. The decree to restore Jerusalem was given by Artaxerxes, in 457 BC, counting forward 483 years from 457 BC brings us to 27 AD, the year of Yahushua's baptism. Remarkably, the Messiah was baptized in the precise year indicated by the angel almost 600 years earlier. We can be certain 27 AD was the year of Yahushua's baptism because Luke, in the third chapter of his gospel, tells us it took place in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Gabriel goes on to say, the Messiah would be cut off and then the city would be destroyed. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off but not for himself, and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. In the final verse of this great prophecy, Yahweh's messenger elaborates on the details of the 70th prophetic week. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week but in the middle of the week he shall bring to an end sacrifice and offering. For the duration of the 70th prophetic week, the Messiah would confirm a covenant with many. He then goes on to say, the Messiah would cause the sacrifices and offering to cease in the middle of this final prophetic week. Here, counting forward seven years, one prophetic week, from Yahushua's baptism in the autumn of 27 AD, brings us to the autumn of 34 AD. 
This places the middle of the 70th week in the spring of 31 AD. This makes clear it was in the spring of 31 AD Yahushua was crucified. He was cut off in the middle of the 70th prophetic week just as the angel had foretold. Following Yahushua's crucifixion, the new covenant he preached throughout his three and a half year ministry was carried forward and confirmed by the apostles. The invitation to accept the covenant was extended to the Jewish nation until the culmination of the 70th prophetic week in the autumn of 34 AD, when in a final act of rebellion against heaven, the Sanhedrin murdered Stephen, the first Christian martyr. As heaven's final confirmation, the 70th prophetic week allotted for the Jewish nation and earthly Jerusalem had been fulfilled. The city and the temple were destroyed in 70 AD, just as the angel had prophesied. Thus, the 70 prophetic weeks were fulfilled in perfect detail. The time allotted for the Jewish nation now accomplished, the gospel was to be carried to the Gentiles at that time. We have established with certainty 31 AD was the year of Yahushua's crucifixion according to Scripture. Let us examine the larger implications of this fact, namely, the weekly seven-day cycle we observe today has not been cycling without interruption since creation. The modern Gregorian calendar is a counterfeit. According to Scripture, Yahushua was crucified on the day of the Passover, which is always on the 14th day of the first lunar month. Scripture also tells us that was the day before the Sabbath, which is the sixth day of the week. Putting it all together, we know Yahushua was crucified on the sixth day of the week, on the 14th day of the first lunar month, and in the year 31 AD. There are different schools of thought as to when a biblical month and a biblical year commence. We will, however, examine the year of the crucifixion using all reckoning methods to see if it is at all possible to have a Friday crucifixion. First, let us see if it is possible to have a Friday crucifixion using the dawn after conjunction method for reckoning New Moon Day. To do this, we must note the time of the conjunction for both March and April in 31 AD, for the new year could have begun in either of these months when all methods of reckoning the beginning of the year are equally considered. In 31 AD, the lunar-solar conjunction in March took place on the 11th at 10.20 p.m. UTC. In April, the conjunction took place on the 10th at 11.33 a.m. UTC, Universal Coordinated Time. This places the crucifixion on March 25th, the equivalent of what the Gregorian calendar today calls Sunday, or on April 24, the equivalent of what the Gregorian calendar today calls Tuesday. These do not even come close to a Friday crucifixion. Now let us try using the first visible crescent methodology to begin the month, as many traditionalists advocate. According to scholars, it takes 16.5 to 42 hours after conjunction for the crescent to become visible in Jerusalem. In the Near East, it takes 16.5 to 42 hours after conjunction 
before the moon becomes visible again in the form of a thin crescent waxing larger and larger until the time of the full moon. That means we should expect the first visible crescent to consistently appear 17 to 42 hours after conjunction in Jerusalem. Now let us examine the month of March in 31 AD to see if it is possible to arrive at a Friday crucifixion using the first visible crescent to begin the month. The earliest crescent in March would potentially have been visible just after sunset on the 12th at the age of 17.5 hours. If, however, it was not, it would surely have been visible on the evening of March 13 at the age of 41.5 hours, making March 14 New Moon Day. This would place the crucifixion on March 27, the equivalent of the modern Tuesday. Clearly, it was not possible to have a Friday crucifixion in the month of March in 31 AD. Now, let us examine the month of April to see if it is possible to arrive at a Friday crucifixion again using the first visible crescent to begin the month. The first visible crescent in April would likely have been spotted just after sunset on the 11th when it was 28.5 hours old. If, however, it was not, it would certainly have been seen on April 12 when it set about two hours after the sun at the age of 52.5 hours with a 5% illumination. This would make April 13 New Moon Day and would place the crucifixion on April 26, the equivalent of the modern Thursday. Here again, it is not possible to arrive at a Friday crucifixion. In order to maintain the crucifixion took place on a Friday in 31 AD, traditionalists must posit the first crescent was not visible until it was 76.5 hours old with a 10% illumination. Remember again, the accepted age parameters for determining visibility are 17 to 42 hours. How can anyone in good conscience embrace such an outrageous proposition? Honesty demands we follow the evidence wherever it may lead, even if it does not agree with our traditions and cherish presuppositions. In fact, there could not have been a Friday crucifixion in 31 AD, and it has been confirmed by scholars across the board, including the late Sir Isaac Newton, the man esteemed by many as the father of modern physics. Newton thus excluded AD 31, 32, and 35 because 14 Nissan could not have been a Friday which has been confirmed by all modern researchers. Scripture makes clear through Daniel's remarkable 70 weeks prophecy, the Savior was crucified in 31 AD. Scripture also makes clear the crucifixion took place on the sixth day of the week and on the 14th day of the first lunar month. When all of the calendrical details are brought together, it is incontrovertibly clear the Israelites were using a different calendar than the world observes today. They were not using the Julian calendar, which was the precursor to the modern papal Gregorian calendar with its continuous weekly cycle. Rather, they were using the biblical lunar solar calendar for determining all of heaven's appointed feast days, including the seventh-day Sabbath. In Scripture, each lunation starts with the celebration of a special day of worship, New Moon Day. Six work days follow, and then a seventh-day Sabbath on the eighth of the month. Three more weeks follow, ending on the 29th. The weekly cycle then restarts following the next New Moon Day. No month ever has more than 30 days. Every time a seventh-day Sabbath in Scripture is assigned a date, 
it always falls on the 8th, 15th, 22nd, and 29th days of the month. We implore you, beloved of Yahweh, not to take our word for it. Please investigate these things for yourselves. Many objections to the lunar Sabbath seem valid on the surface, but fail miserably under close examination. Again, we implore you to dig deep into this issue with an honest heart.